everyone. Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Dean Mitchell. Get comfortable wherever you're listening to this podcast. You're about to enter the smartest doctor in the room. Today's topic should be very important to all of us. How to get the most benefit from your doctor visits. You know, we all know that seeing a doctor can be anxiety provoking. You don't know if the doctor will find something wrong with you. He may be worried he or she won't take your complaints seriously. He may be worried they don't even like you or find you annoying. As silly as that sounds, that may be critically important. And, uh, you know, again, essentially will convey the doctor's demeanor. Um, but you do, most patients do want their doctors to care about them, to take them seriously. And a lot of patients really generally want their doctors to like them. So these are all these uh, intangibles. I believe one of the most important qualities of a good doctor-patient visit is that the patient feels they are not on this medical journey alone and that they have a trusted supporter. But what's interesting, doctors really don't get any kind of special training in this area to be better communicators. My guest today, Dr. Joseph Capella, is an expert in this area. He has published over 200 articles in this area and co-authored books. He is the Gerald R. Miller Professor Emeritus of Communication at the Annenberg School of Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. I reached out to Dr. Capella after I read an article in a recent journal of the American Medical Association that he co-authored with Dr. Richard Street titled Delivering Effective Messages in the Patient-Clinician Encounter. Essentially, the translation of that title is, are you and your doctor on the same page? So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Joseph Capella to the podcast and uh, learn more about what he believes can make this a better experience. Good afternoon. Thank you. Okay. So Dr. Capella, I want to ask you something. Um, I, I was giving a lot of thought to this because, you know, doctors in general, a lot of them can be sort of like book nerds. You know, they were very good at school, very good at analyzing data. For a long time, they weren't always considered exactly, you know, people persons. Um, do you feel that some doctors are just innately better communicators? Um, or is this something that can get better and does get better with time? Or do people just stay stagnant if they were not good at communicating to begin with? And, you know, they'll kind of throughout their career, that's going to be what they're like. Well, it's hard, it's hard to know uh, how to answer that question in sort of general terms, but obviously there are people who are sort of naturally good communicators. They are good at empathy from the get-go. They have a natural sort of skill in interacting with uh, with people and so on. But like all behavior, all human behaviors, um, you know, to a certain extent, people can learn to be a little bit better at what they're doing and with some simple kind of uh, simple kind of guidance. That doesn't uh, that isn't going to make me into a great orator, you know, from uh, just from a little bit of instruction. But I can be a better orator, you know, from a little bit of speech instruction. And similarly, in the interpersonal domain, uh, and just like you can become a better doctor by uh, you know learning your your skills and uh, you know doing good clinical work uh, in the uh, in the office environment, in the interpersonal environment, there's some learning that can, you know, help everybody uh, to a certain extent. And then there's going to be some natural talent. So it's got to be obviously a mix. Uh, there's not, mm. not much uh, question you know, about that. You know, in medicine, I think also what happens, it's interesting, is that there's a little bit of a natural selection. Um, people that were good students and become medical students, then they get into the clinical work. Uh, some of them, and they're very good doctors, you know, will, will gravitate to radiology or anesthesiology or pathology where there isn't that much interpersonal um, connection. So it's interesting. Um, and sometimes even surgeons are felt to be that way. They like, you know, doing the, they like doing the, the, the work versus uh, actually having to listen for, you know, and take histories and get really down in the, uh, down the dirt with the patients. Um, in the JAMA it's like, art, it's like in the family practice area, right. you want somebody who's, 
you know, who can deal with the range of people, the, the right. kids and, you know, and the, uh, and the teens and the, right. the older, the older folks as well. Um, uh, everybody wants Marcus will be back. If people remember that TV show. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're dating yourself. I know. I know. I should be talking about Grey's Anatomy, but that, that shows yeah. all about sex and every the doctors are having all the fun and, you know, anyway. Uh, all right. Let's get into, cause I think this is, is really actually a fascinating area. Um, you know, the whole idea of communication, which is obviously your specialty. And we're going to get into the different communication strategies that you lay out in your article, which I think are very important and any doctor can work on to get better. You know, it's funny. I just want to mention two things because it is a, in some ways a very, quote, hot topic. Like one of my favorite books, which is not exactly on this topic, but is Never Split the Difference. I don't know if you've ever read this, but this is by Chris Voss. He was an FBI uh, hostage negotiator and he later on went into the business world. So he has all of these great tips, which is interesting how they kind of overlap with some of your things. And also there's a very popular book now on the uh, bestseller list by Charles Duhogg called Super Communicators. Again, I like your article. You kind of really condense it and get to the meat of it, especially for a doctor. But again, this is obviously, and especially in this whole new world now where AI may play a role, again, things that I'm listening to, communication between humans may be more important than ever. So, all right, let's get into the first of your strategies. Uh, you call it uncovering patient beliefs and knowledge. And the first sentence in this section that you have, is, you say, creating a trusting and respectful relationship with patients is the basis for effective communication. So I'm going to ask you, uh, this is something that I just sort of ended up doing naturally a lot of times. Before a, pa a doctor starts to delve into, you know, go right to it, the problems the patient's having, is it better to try to connect with some general questions. Cause typically what I do you know, when I have patients, some of them come from far away to see me. I'll typically say to them, where do you live? How, how long did it take you to get to the office? You know, really quote small talk, but I'm trying to relax them so that they uh, are not tense and not defensive. Is that a good strategy? Sure. In, in all communications, part of what you're going to want, well, all interpersonal communications, part of what you're going to try to do is to establish a little bit of rapport with the other other individual. But the rapport is one thing. It's kind of relaxation and making people feel good about, uh, about right. what's about to happen and so on. But there's also information gathering, which is something else that right. you need to accomplish as a doctor, because there's a, there are some important tasks that are about to take place in the context uh, that uh, you're operating in. And so yeah, that information gathering part of it is necessary, but, you know, maybe you don't want to start with that information gathering uh, from minute one, but certainly by minute two, you want to get there because uh, your time is valuable and your time is expensive and you've got other patients uh, waiting for you. So, you know, there's got to be a kind of efficiency here. And there's only so much time that you can spend. Uh, right. You know, but in, I you think know, what you're saying in this, and the way I always felt was you're really just trying to make a connection. I mean, like, again, if somebody yeah. said to me, if somebody said, I know you're in Philadelphia. So if uh, somebody came to me, which they have from Philadelphia for treatment for allergies or molds, things that I do, uh, I might say to them, oh, Philadelphia, I was there last year at a wedding at that yeah. this beautiful uh, museum, you know? And so, again, it's just like trying to make some kind of connection sure. so people feel like I'm going to hopefully, as we get deeper into things, that I'm listening to them or that I'm like on their side. I mean that that of course makes a lot of a lot of sense. Again, it's a kind of rapport building that uh, mm -hmm. that takes place uh, early on, and rapport is going to be uh, enhanced to the extent that that there, there's some kind of similarity or common ground mm -hmm. uh, between the you know the physician and the patient. And there's going to be a lot of times when there isn't any obvious demographic similarity, right. you know, in terms of uh, social class or even or race or age or anything of that sort. So you're searching for some other form of, uh, you know, of common ground. Um, uh, you know, you might you might not want to insult the Eagles if you're from New York. But, uh, uh, no, I, I tease them because I'm a huge would, Giants fan. Work. No, I'm a huge <laughs> Giants fan. Now, what I'll be humble about is I'll say, boy, you, these last – Decade, you Eagles have been kicking our butts, you know, but, uh, and they'll laugh, right, and, you know, right. so you're right. You have, have some, to have some fun with that. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we'll get to the humor. Now, you know, the next question that you mentioned, I kind of never would want to use. And I'll tell you why in a second, but you say also now, as we focus on the patient, you might want to ask the patient, so what do you think is going on? 
And you mentioned that you said that's showing respect for the patient, but I could flip that around a little bit. Some patients I would think might get annoyed and say, well, how, how should I know? Uh, you're the doctor. I mean, so how yeah. do you use that phrase? Well, I mean, it's as, it's as simple as saying what, you know, what brings you in today? Okay. Uh, you know, so you've got to know what the, you know, what the problem set right. here is, what the behaviors are that are of concern. And, you know, if they could be as simple as this is my annual checkup, but you would know that uh -huh. in advance. Right. Um, but it could also be, you know, beyond what's in the, uh, in, you know, in the checklist for the annual yeah. review, but it could be something very specific. Oh, you know, I've got a nagging pain in my yeah. left hip, whatever it might be. So, you know, so it's information gathering uh, in a mm. very real and direct sense. And of course, every doctor is going to do that to some degree. And the only question is, are they, you know, are they um, uh, careful about it? And does the patient feel like that they, they can provide those kinds of answers uh, and uh, with, you know, without any hesitation um, mm. or, you know, or concern about uh, about how the doctor might respond? So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it, it's straightforward information gathering. You know, what I typically would like to do with patients is I like to say to them, what do you want to work on today? I sort of like to make it like it's a joint venture, you know, not that I'm like putting it all on them. Yes, kind of that, collaborative, that, collaborative uh, pro problem set up in this case mm. and collaborative problem solving, even though you're the one with the expertise and the information. Right. And you're going to try to steer them toward the right kinds of decisions and the right kind of maneuvers without saying, here's what you need to do, at least not from, you know, from second one, uh, give them a chance to, you know, carry out. And we know that there's a lot of very, very good work done on collaborative decision making in the doctor patient domain. And to the extent that uh, somebody is good at making that happen uh, will enhance the likelihood that the patient feels positive about the interaction and feels like uh, they're a partner rather than a just a, a client uh, who's extracting information. Yeah. Not only a client. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being a client, but but not only a client. Yeah. Another strategy you mentioned I think is important I'm sure the patients feel this way is that the doctor's hearing the patient. And you mentioned one of the things that you say have the doctor basically um, a, a say after a patient has brought something up. So what you're saying is, and you know, it's interesting. This reminds me, I don't know if you labeled it as this is like we call mirroring. And that's what actually yeah. is very interesting. Chris Voss in the, uh, in the uh, never split the difference hostage negotiation would do that frequently. And I guess he feels that's a very important strategy because by doing that, you're basically letting the patient in this case know that you are listening and you want to clarify if there's anything that is not, you know, you know, obvious to both the patient and the doctor. Well, the, re the, re the notion of repetition in a different set of words, I think, is is really important. And it works on both sides of the of the desk in some senses with the, you know, with the doctor saying, well, you know, here's what uh, I, I, I think you're trying to tell me. And then and then saying, you know, and then and not just then jumping into the, the next uh, step, but saying, do I have it right? You know, mm -hmm. let, them, let them do some some re rewording if necessary. Uh, or especially at that juncture, if they don't think they fully understand what the doc said, because the doctor has maybe used some technical, technical language as uh, you know as is common, uh, so they may need to be some rewording of that of that on both sides of the aisle. So it, the checking can you know work both ways, and it takes a it takes a little more time. No you know, yeah, you know, typically what I like to do too, I like to, I like to draw and write on handouts that I give to patients. But as I'm explaining things, I'll typically like to ask them something to the effect of like, does this make sense to you? You know, yes. do, are you following? Because I want, you know, I know I'm, I'm trying to translate in my case, let's say like immunology or something that's, that's, you know, technical, but trying to put it into layman's terms so that, you know, again, they feel confident because it's going to take us to our next uh, category, which is, you put is, you know, providing accurate and understandable information. Yes. And yeah. you mentioned here, you say, uh, and this is this kind of interesting. I want to play around with this a little bit. You know that a doctor's obviously my role. You know, since I'm not a surgeon, I'm not cutting people. Is that I got to provide information to to the patients? And um, I think you put here, yeah, in in, in the article, you know, that you, to present to the patient. You know, there are pros and cons to this treatment. Let's explore each one. And I, I understand that in this way, you're trying to make you know, include the patient and make them a co-decision maker in contrast to back in the old, old days. I think with doctors, even though it's funny, they had so much less 
treatments and everything, but doctors tended to be a little bit more arrogant and bombastic. And, and they were almost like, this is what you must do. This was of course before yeah. the age of Google. <laughs> so, um, what do you think? But the thing also is you have to be careful with this is that a doctor still, this almost goes to Daniel Kahneman's work, you know, about, um, you know, how information is presented, uh, you know, the old, he used to give the analogy a lot of times, like if a doctor went in and said, um, you know, well, let's say, for example, they had to have a procedure done. They say, well, there's only a 10% risk that you'll have a bad yeah. reaction. And the patient, oh, 10% is not bad, you know, or, um, you know, versus saying like, you know, um, you know, 90% of the patients get better with this. Right. So right. yeah. what's your gain, what's, gain frame, the so-called gain frames and loss frames. Yes. Right. So what, yeah. what do you think that is the, the strategy on both sides? And, and the one that obviously helps the patient make the best decision. You know, what does the doctor have to be careful of? Well, I think a couple of things. One is the doctor does need to provide, you know, information about what the, you know, what the best science is today, but like with all science and all medical, medical knowledge as well, um, there's a, um, there's a sense in which uh, those, that kind of knowledge and so on can change. And right. we've seen that with so many domains of, of scientific practice, whether it's about diet or it's about, uh, uh, you know, it's about uh, current states, about surgery, about prostate cancer, whatever the case may be, things change. And so making clear that you're giving them the best available information today with the notion that uh, you will update it and it will need to be updated uh, as that information changes, if indeed it if indeed it does. But by maxim you can't maximize uncertainty to patients, it seems to me, by saying, well, we don't really know for sure, you know, but so here's my best guess. And so now what you're doing is you're sort of uh, making, you're undermining your own credibility because you haven't, you don't have good guidance for them. So you've got to be somewhere in between, it's, you know, it's- It's, it's very a, tricky because what it typically happens is, I know that what I try to do, I try to present a little bit both sides as, as a little bit unbiased as I can, but what will typically happen at the end, the patient will say, well, what would you do if it was your family? <laughs> you know, and I sometimes don't mind saying, um, sometimes I, it's, I don't have an answer because it's, sometimes it's just too difficult to, uh, you know, to make that decision for somebody. So, you know, that, that's a little bit the conundrum that, you know, we as doctors face. You know, the other thing, which I think is very important, and I like to take a lot of pride in this, and you mentioned this in the, um, again, you know, under this category of providing information, I feel like the doctor needs to be the medical translator. So the patient doesn't feel like they're in a foreign country and they don't speak the language. I typically like to use analogies in this. Like, so for example, like I do desensitizations to people with food allergies, environmental allergies. And when I'm explaining how it works, I say to them, you know, we started very low doses and then every month you get a stronger dose. So I said, it's almost like working out, like you're building up, you know, strength in a way so your body can tolerate it. And uh, so that's what I try to do. But I was just curious yourself, is there any special strategies or anything that you think are really important in getting the patients to understand what you're saying, you know, you know, in, in, if it has to do with medical jargon. Yeah, they, cl clearly there needs to be some uh, self-reflection on the part of the physician here uh, to understand when uh, it, uh, they are using language that is uh, not necessarily in the public <laughs> public domain. Right. Um, and it's, it's easier, of course, for professionals and experts to go to that language because they're familiar with it and they know exactly what, you know, certain terminology means and doesn't mean. And so by using that expert, ex that, uh, that uh, expert temp terminology, they uh, are avoiding making medical mistakes in terms of what they say, but in the process may not be communicating with the patient. And so what they may say is, you know, here's what, uh, here's what the best available scientific and medical information is at this point, and here's what that means for you. And so in some senses, you know, you have to, it seems to me, you, you've, you've got to make that, that transition. And that's a, you know, that's a learned skill and it requires a kind of deliberation and self-reflection on the part of the physician so that uh, he or she is 
you know, doing the best that he or she can in terms of providing accurate information, but information which can be consumed and, uh, and can be understood by the uh, by their their clients. You know, what was really interesting it, it, just just yesterday in my office, which it reminded me of the challenge of doing some of this. I had a young girl that came in that was having chronic rashes and um, also respiratory issues. And she was a very precocious, very bright fourth grader. And she she was there with her father. And, you know, I'm, and I'm going through my usual thing explaining and I try to include the kids, but every once in a while she was popping up and goes, English, please, English. <laughs> <laughs> Smart so, kid. Smart right. Kid. She's very yeah. bright. And I yeah. it kind of took me back because, you know, what is a challenge, which I love, uh, I'm sure for pediatricians and anyone who takes care of children is the challenge of, you know, um, comforting essentially the parent or, make, you know, providing the information because they're going to have to obviously make the decision for their child, the minor in this case, but also to have, make sure, you know, when the child's old enough that they understand things, you know, and get them on board as well. So uh, it is an art. There's just no other way. We're going to get to, I think, some other things that don't have to do with, with speaking at all that are really important in making, you know, a child put at ease, you know, because, you know, they're people too. Um, you, the next category you talk about is promote credibility of information. Yeah. Uh, I thought this was interesting, too, because one of the I guess one of the terms you have is value of affirmation. Yes. Basically, what is a person's priorities or what's most important to them? And I remember yes. something really interesting. Somebody else I interviewed on the podcast was a top hematologist oncologist. And I'll never forget in his, the book that he wrote, and we discussed this on the podcast, uh, yeah, Dr. Sakaris, he was great. Um, he talked about in his book a story about he had a patient that had leukemia and just really didn't want to do treatment. You know, he just, it was, he wasn't, there was nothing wrong with him. I mean, whatever, and, you know, mentally, he just, I don't want to do this. I you know he, they laid out whatever with the stem cell transplant, everything that all involved. He's like, you know what, I'd rather just go home. And if that's the end, that's the end. And, but they felt that they could really treat him. They thought his odds were fairly good that he would survive. And what they, what they ended up doing was they, you know, when the family came in and got involved and obviously they were all trying to convince them. And a few days later, when they, when Dr. Sakaris came by and, you know, trying to find out, are you going to do the treatment? Should we discharge you to go home? He says, I'm going to do the treatment. He goes, I realized I couldn't leave my wife alone yet. I still, you know, I, she, I know she needs me, you know, so how do doctors, you know, again, in their limited time find out you know, what a person's priorities are. Well, I, the thing that we're talking about here is is sort of more more general kinds of values that mm -hmm. folks have, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, you know, what the very specific kinds of of goals and needs and, and so on that individual families have. And obviously, when there's a long-term relationship between a doctor and the family and patients, you do have a better sense of, you know, of what uh, the specific needs of particular individuals and particular families are. But the, this, the notion here is, is, the, is the concept of uh, a value set that's broadly shared in the population. So, for example, it is you know, one of those is, uh, you know, care for care for loved ones. And so one of the things that um, that uh, takes place there is that if, if a person thinks that this is something that they don't, you're asking them to do something that they um, aren't interested in, in doing because it's difficult for them, it's a difficult procedure or treatment or, or testing, testing regimen, then part of what you may do is say, we, we of course, you want to be the, the best partner parent uh, that you can possibly be for your for your family. And so you need to be healthy to do that. And so that's a value, the value of maintaining health and security, not just for yourself, but for somebody else as well. And so appealing to those kinds of values, which are widely shared, not values that are specific to this family and to this person, which you may or may not know. Uh, obviously, you know, having a long term relationship means that you can know those things, especially if there's a primary, you know, you're the primary care physician. You can know some of those things about the, the specific values and specific needs of of individuals. But I'm talking here about more general ones that could more readily um, be used because they're widely shared across not only uh, uh, groups within within the culture, but actually across cultures as well. So, you know, uh, there's a there's a half a dozen such values, care for others, 
um, you know, security and safety for yourself, uh, and then obviously care and, and safety for for loved ones, and a few others uh, that are right at the top of the list. Take advantage of those, and you know that becomes the basis for making a yeah. what I would call, in my language, persuasive appeal. Um, mm-hmm. And it's just you know it's a good way of just saying this is why you need to do this because of the kind of of outcome that's going to be valuable. Uh, to not your, just yourself, but to the loved ones who are so important to you. Mm. Another thing that obviously was just so important about promoting credibility, you mentioned, is about obviously debunking inaccurate information. And this gets really tricky because patients do tend to focus on the side effects in the worst case scenarios. Um, I've heard, you know, again, typically, you know, you'll, you'll hear patients come in saying, I, I don't want vaccines that cause autism, which has right. pretty much been debunked. Or a patient will come in to say to me, I, I don't want to take this drug. I read somewhere it causes Alzheimer's. Right. And, you know, I know probably the best response a doctor can do sometimes, you know, it's, cause it's not exactly like they have the journal right in their hand and they don't want to antagonize the patient by saying, that's really stupid. You know, where did you get this from Google, you know, kind of thing. So what's the best way, you know, to, uh, because in a sense, we're negotiators here. Yes. <laughs> we're like medical negotiators, not hostage negotiators. How, how do, what is the best way to, uh, if a doctor has a pretty strong feeling like that the patient has inaccurate information? Yeah, I mean, so there's a couple of, uh, cl- you know, important classes to distinguish in the, in the misinformation arena. One is uh, misinformation that's very well established. As a in the minds of the individual, those that's going to be a much more difficult kind of misinformation to um, debunk, to unearth, to unearth because it's got an inertia, it's got a history. Um, you know, if you're giving, a, if you're dealing with uh, misinformation which has just become uh, current in the family, so for example, if you're dealing with parents who are thinking about giving the HPV vaccine to their children. Uh, and they haven't uh, yet gone online and and uh, you know <laughs> been advocates for uh, you know for uh, anti-vaxxing about uh, about the HPV vaccine. Then you can have a chance of doing a, a I think a good job of providing them with necessary count- counter information. Uh, again, not by sending them to the medical journals, but by telling them. Uh, uh, in advance as much as you possibly can about the potential for misinformation and the fact that these people who have misinformation are not necessarily, uh, you know, do not necessarily have your best interests at heart. They may have other other motivations and so on. But again, the idea is to attack the information and not so much to attack the, attack the people because a lot of times the information is coming from sources who have some element of trust even though they don't deserve that trust, but they have it anyway on the part of the on the part of the patients. So there, I think there are no easy solutions here. But at least you have to uh, provide uh, as much as you can early information that can debunk prebunk. Really, is what the, the language here that's uh, sometimes. Why used. is it called prebunk? Yeah, why, why is it prebunk versus before, debunk? Or people have to make the decision, uh, and before they receive too much misinformation, you're going to give them the debunking information early to the extent possible. So if you know that, again, for the first child who uh, has to potentially receive the HPV vaccine, um, um, but you can you can go to the parent and start talking about the possibility of doing this. And you can just say, yes, you should need to do this. And, you know, don't pay attention to the misinformation that uh, that is well, out there. Yeah, you know the hardest you thing. You want to give is, them the misinformation either. You don't want to yeah. start it by, by providing right. it. Right, but one of the last things, which I think is so important, it's just it is what you know. And I'll tell you how I handle it. But you know, today it's really the doctors versus the internet. You know, because yes. uh, back in the day there was no internet, and people really relied on their doctors for that information. I mean, he was the yes. funnel of that information. What I say to patients these days, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts. Basically, what I say to patients is. Look, I am glad that you've gone online. I truly am. And then you've educated yourself and you've gotten information. Uh, I'm pretty experienced as well, 30 years in practice. I read all the journals. I said, I think really at the end of the day, if you're coming to see me, um, hopefully you're going to rely on my experience. If I've seen a thousand cases of this type of reaction, yes, I think 80, 90% of the time, I'm going to sort of be in the right direction for you. I mean, whereas yeah. if you just read the information, you'll be all over, you know, you won't be able to make that 
that decision because that, that's what medicine is. I do make the differentiation between law and medicine because I have a lot of lawyers in my family and I do find they're very good at arguing, but rarely always come to a consensus. And in medicine, you know, that's one of the, I thought one of the most interesting and fascinating uh, parts of the training is that when you're on call at night with a sick patient, you have to make a decision. You have to, in your mind, based on your data and your exams and everything, decide what's the most likely thing here and should we go ahead and treat it? You must make a decision because indecision could be, you know, very costly. And, and you as the personal doctor are generally seen by most of your patients as a very credible source, not only in terms of expertise, mm -hmm. but trust, but trustworthiness. Right. And that's right. one of the things that we, that we know. And it's one of the great advantages to having a longer term relationship with your, oh, absolutely. your primary care physician rather than, you know, uh, the kind of relationship that develops from the very short term kinds of interactions with the senior uh, with the specialists, I'm, I'm sorry, not with senior, yeah. but with specialists. Well, I'll tell you, you know, it's really sad. I mean, as you probably know, I mean, everybody's experiencing the country, you know, the way medicine has changed so much. I would say, honestly, I would say less than maybe 20, 25% of the patients still have an ongoing long-term relationship with their doctor, whether it's due to managed yeah. care, insurance, doctors retiring, doctors becoming more employees and switching around. So it's it's been very challenging, I think, because you know, most of my patients, I've been practice 30 years and I, I'm a specialist, and but I have patients I've taken care of for 25 years <laughs> dating myself, yep. but most yep. of them do not have a primary doctor for more than a couple of years. It's, it's yep. especially in New York City, but uh, yeah. anyway. Yeah. Uh, let's go into one last thing on this section, which I think is really important too, because I, I find this interesting. You know, you talk about stories, and yes. I know everybody likes a good story. I, I like a good story, and especially with a happy outcome. And honestly, I naturally use this a lot with my patients. I mean, being 30 years of practice, I got a lot of stories, uh, and I find it's very effective. The only thing I sometimes now second guess myself. Is it manipulative? I mean, D uh, John Caldini, who's very famous for his book called Persuasion. I don't know if you're yes. familiar with it. I know, you know. I know the book and I know yeah, Caldini. He's, yes. he's really. Yeah, he's great. You know, and uh, it's very interesting how people can be persuaded by somebody who knows these techniques or can, can just naturally, you know, because, again, well, how would it come up in my practice? You know, a patient may say to me, you know, Dr. Mitchell, um, you know, I'll just I'll give you an example. I, um, I'm highly allergic to dogs. I, I can't be near a dog and I would love to get a dog for my kids, you know, da, 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 da. And then I'll say to them, okay, listen, I do have a story. I had a patient, a mother that was highly allergic to dogs. Her two kids wanted a dog so badly, came to me several years ago. Um, I evaluated her, found that she was highly allergic from the testing. I treated her with my sublingual algae drops and Eventually, the, the family got a dog and she was fine, you know, and, uh, you know, they uh, I think they relate to that, you know, but I am cherry picking a little bit, um, sure. but most of the time it's pretty accurate. So yeah. what's your thoughts on that about, you know, stories and you well, know, to, you're raising an important, important ethical issue. And that is, the, you know, is, is the story that you tell. Is it truthful? Uh, <laughs> essentially, that's right. Is it, okay. is it, communi is it communicating? Is, yeah. Is it communicating information that is information that you could that, that you could communicate in a different way, uh, in a more expository, more descriptive kind of fashion, and and be cons consistent with the the advice that you're providing? And so it's there's an ethical uh, issue here. And if the story is a manipulative story in the sense that it is uh, not telling the whole truth or right. uh, is insufficient in terms of uh, the kind of guidance and advice it's giving, then in some senses that story, which is context specific, person specific, mm -hmm. right. tied to characters and all of that sort of thing, and doesn't use the fancy language that you would probably prefer to use and be completely accurate, uh, then the story is going to be, um, you know, a potentially useful persuasive tool encouraging people to accept the information that you're you're providing, and it's also a story. Uh, what we know about stories is they have a kind of stickiness, a mental stickiness. They stay in people's memories a little they bit do. better than, yeah. you know, those risk probabilities that you're <laughs> that you're providing them that are the more accurate and the more um, uh, scientifically sound data. But yeah. they are also not uh, uh, what sticks in people's minds mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes not just not even understood. Yeah. Yeah. 
The last one, before we go to something a little bit different, is uh, you talk about check for understanding. And I thought that was, I mean, again, all these techniques are so important. I was, I enjoyed so much reading your article because fortunately, I think over the years I developed and I borrowed from really good doctors that mentored me. And I tried to cherry pick all the things I thought were really interesting. And, you know, and you mentioned that it's good to ask the patient at, you know, toward the end, do they understand what you discussed or not? I like to personally, I have these like homemade handouts where I write personal handwritten notes on them. And again, this is something I learned from one of my old time colleagues, because, you know, you could give a patient, you know, typically, you know, know, this happens, somebody's going for colonoscopy, here's the handout, this is how you prepare, you know, or this is, or after surgery, these are the things, you know, and it's typed out, like, you know, typical, you know, generic thing. But when I'm discussing with patients about what's going on with their immune system, how we're going to try to rebalance their immune system, I have some diagrams, but I also put handwritten notes to make it very personalized, which I I find is helpful. And again, I learned this from a colleague. Do, do you like that concept? I mean, what what do you think is one of the best ways to really uh, bring home the key information a patient should walk away from? Walk well, away I mean, I, you know, I think people have different dispositions toward uh, the way in which uh, they process information best. And there are some, you know, there are some physicians um, and some offices which will say, do you prefer, would you prefer to have, you know, a textual summary? Would you prefer to have a graphical summary? Would you prefer to have, you know, me provide you with a, an, an audio message of some, of, mm. of some sort? And each of those ways are, are you know, are can be medically completely equivalent um, with a little more effort in some cases than other. I wasn't suggesting that you make a video, but that's not so difficult either anymore. But storing well, it and retrieving it is another trick. You know, you know it's interesting you say that. I just I totally forgot. I've had a few patients who I think are very smart. They've sometimes said to me, do you mind if I record uh, on their like on their phone the, yeah. the conversation? I said, sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, if it yeah. helps you, then, you know, because I know people get nervous or they can't remember yeah. everything. And, uh, yeah, you know, especially that's if they're getting using, some, yeah, that's we're using technology some, to our advantage. Yes. And so there's going to be individual differences there. And if the, you know, if the physician's office can tolerate uh, the, you know, a uh, multidimensional approach to the presentation of the information. We, and all we're talking about is, you know, th- or, you know, three or four different platforms for presenting the same information. Right. You know, the doctor may be, may be more comfortable with one kind of information than mm. uh, one kind of platform rather than another kind of platform. Uh, and so, you know, that's that's going to uh, curtail and and uh, filter which ones are they're willing to willing to try. But people have different dispositions um, and some offices will ask them what kinds of ways do they prefer to process information. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think any of those can can work. It's just that what can you do efficiently and what can you do uh, uh, it for uh, each of your patients without uh becoming buried by the efforts that you have to take. Yeah. I want to mention, talk about just for a few minutes too, communication techniques that you didn't cover in the article. I, again, I'm a kind of like a student of this a little bit because I find it fascinating. So something like eye contact, obviously mm-hmm. probably very important. I mean, doctors know it, it took a while, but a lot of them realized, you know, typing on a computer with your back to the patient, not a good way to be to begin the business. So, so what do they do instead? A lot of places I see now they have, you know, these little like units that the computer rests on and the doctor's facing the patient, but they're still typing away. So obviously yeah. eye contact, is it, I mean, like what I try to do, cause I, I, I think about this a lot, like, you know, again, when you're seeing maybe like 10 patients a day or 15, like I do, there are probably some practices that are seeing 30 or 40. So it's really overwhelming, but I try to quickly review the patient's chart information on my computer before they walk into the door. So I, you know, I can start off the uh, conversation where I'm looking at them. Um, and then if I have to refer, you know, if they say, well, what was my test show last time compared to this one, then I have to look on the computer. But do you think eye contact, you know, when a doctor, when the patient's first walking in, very important? So uh, I'm ecstatic that you brought up nonverbal behavior. We couldn't really cover that in this article. Mm, we had a okay. very tight, very tight right. word limit in it, right. in it. And I spent the first uh, probably 15 or 20 years of my career studying nonverbal behavior uh, oh, pretty wow. extens- extensively. And so there are a variety of nonverbal behaviors and eye contact is one of them. It's interesting you say, well, I want to make eye contact with my patients. And my guess is that you probably don't stare at them. 
And so no, I got I, no. <laughs> they're looking at them. But I'm looking, like, the, it's not like they walk in the door and I'm like looking at, you know, their chart on the computer yep. or looking down at something or whatever. I'm <laughs> like, I'm, I'm basically acknowledging them and I'm yep. trying to welcome them into, especially yep. for the first time, if they don't even know me, that, you know, because everybody's sizing everybody up. This is primal things that we all... Yep. Do and and the other thing I was going to mention to you too, which I'm sure again sounds like you studied this for a long time. I remember my dad; it was very interesting. He he was in finance, but he I'll never forget when he told me early in his career they sent him to a course where they also studied body language. Like you know, if he would go like, as a salesperson to yeah. somebody, he said if somebody's arms are crossed, you know, legs are crossed or whatever. Uh, and of course, he said people that smoke the pipe, you're never going to get a sale on them. <laughs> but uh, you know, but reading somebody's body language, even as they. As they come in, do, is their head down? Uh, do they look yeah. fearful? You know, I mean, again, these are things we're never taught. And that, we, you know, we're taught to look at a sick patient in a bed. But, yeah. you know, then you get into most of our real life as medicine. You have people walking into your office who want help. But a lot of things have to go on before you can get to that place of helping them. Yes. And, you know, there, there's a sort of a general sense of sort of peop, uh, some physicians who are particularly expressive individuals in the sense that they have a lot of variation in their speech voice in, in, in the in the levels of loudness uh, into the in their intonation patterns they're gesturally very active and so on and this can be if it's if it's too much it can be off-putting to you know to some patients right. um, but you know the the person who is completely still and seems to be lifeless maybe because they're exhausted <laughs> but also maybe because that's just their personal style maybe they are a little bit more difficult to warm up to and so this whole notion of of having a a an empathic relationship with your patients and having your patients see you as approachable and so on is uh, carried probably mostly by the nonverbal cues that you're that you're giving off and you know uh, you need to be somewhere between uh uh, uh Overly warm and friendly, and you know, cold and distant, <laughs> in order to sort of well, reach yeah. a happy medium. Right. And then there's also an interesting line of uh, research on on the way in which people respond vocally and gesturally, and in terms of movements to their patients. If they're well, that's patients, what I, I have to ask this. You're leading right. You're like you're like going right down the path I want to. Do. So what happens? Well, what would you recommend? Because this happens in my office, and I'm sure it happens in every doctor's office. Like like for example, I have patients that sometimes they've been to ten doctors by the time they get to me. And they're like, oh, my God, you know, you're my last hope, which puts a lot of pressure on me. Uh, yeah. But they'll start crying sometimes. And it's a, it's a little bit awkward. I remember early in my career, like, what do I do? Nobody ever told me what to do in this situation. And yeah. then over time, what I've gotten comfortable doing is either I'll I'll take a box of tissues that I have and hand it to them. I'll even hold their hand. You know, I, you know, and again, as doctors, you know, sometimes, you you know, again, and I know therapists are told like this, like, you know, oh, keep that distance. Don't, you know, and I don't find that works. You know, I, yeah. I think, you know, that, I mean, I'm sure every doctor and has to make his decision what they're comfortable with. But that being said, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, that's a personal style thing. And you obviously have to be very uh, in today's world, very yeah. conscious of, uh, you know, crossing the line. And so right. holding somebody's hand is one thing, you know, putting your hand on their shoulder is another thing. Putting your arm around them is another thing, mm. you know, t you know, touching any other, uh, any other body part. Well, is, that's why patients that give me a hug. They, they say, can I hug you? Oh, and I say, sure. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. because it's, it's again, as I said earlier on too, you know, we all would be really surprised. We, you know, our patients and as patients ourselves, we want our doctor to like us, <laughs> you know, sure. I, you know, I mean, I'm sure people in general want other people to like them, but I think even more, you know, because you feel like this person's going to help me if they like me, you know, I, well, and there's a, there's a, I mean, there is a real <laughs> a, a, a obvious intimacy in the medical yes. encounter, Yeah. Uh, sometimes very intimate. And, uh, you know, that's uh, something that, that is facilitated by having a, a warm, uh, reaction, an empathic reaction, a positive reaction to the physician and vice versa, uh, you know, as well. You know, the, the standoffish patient who is, um, you know, seems to be less responsive to you yeah, is yeah. difficult on you because there is this interchange that takes place 
um, and people have studied for a long time this notion of contagion, sort of uh, vocal contagion and uh, physical contagion as, as people respond to one another's um, movement activities and, and so on. And these are very subtle on under the under the radar screen for sure in terms of people's knowledge and so on, but they they react to them by saying, oh, I really like this person. And, it, you know, he was he or she was the right kind of person for me. We fit well together. And they can't say why, but a lot of times it, it is because of the, the kinds of nonverbal interactions that take place, as well as, of course, overlaid uh, by the important exchanges uh, in 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 terms of words and and uh, and deeds. Mm. And actions, you, know. you know, the last thing in this area um, is really the time factor. And as oh, you yeah. mentioned earlier, and, uh, you know, it's really kind of the difference between an elevator pitch and a deep conversation. And as you know, unfortunately, doctors in a lot of um, hospital based practices, you know, or other kind of facilities have about 10 minutes for a follow up patient. I'm kind of fortunate because I have my own practice. I typically can do 20, 30 minutes with a follow up patient. But even when you're doing 20, 30 minutes, because usually that's enough time to really to get into what has to be done. But sometimes it's hard to end the visit and to make people not feel like they've been shortchanged. What, what's your, if you have any advice on that, even from all, your own personal experience or, you know, cause at some point, you know, right. A doctor can't spend two and a half hours with one patient and that's well, unlikely, can, you know? know, and so they have to say, okay, we're winding down here. What, you know, what do we hope to, you know, go on to the next thing. I mean, I remember reading once, I mean, the worst thing obviously a doctor could do is like basically get up and put their hand on the doorknob, you know, <laughs> before the patient is and, finished. And start but, to exit. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So what yeah, do you I mean, suggest? That'll, that'll, uh, that's, you know, leave taking is always a, <laughs> always a tricky business. Uh, whether you're at uh, somebody's uh, uh, dinner party that's, uh, you know, was boring as right? <laughs> so all get out. So, so what's your trick? <laughs> How do you get out? <laughs> yeah. And you know the phys physicians uh, are in a particularly difficult uh, situation in that. Right, and right. Because I don't have, I don't have good advice about how to. No, how to okay, that'll be your next article. Take. Please work on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, the last part actually, I'm going to take over a little bit, and you could respond to me, or you could ask me a question, because I did a podcast on this once, a solo. Uh, I did it not tongue in cheek. I did it for real. I wrote, "What makes a good prepared patient." to get the most out of your doctor's visit. And people would be really surprised uh, what should be involved. My suggestions were basically prepare like a one page sort of bullet point of topics that you want to discuss, not a 10 page essay novella. Nobody's really going to look at that. You don't have the time. And it just doesn't get what you want to accomplish. Make sure you bring any recent or pertinent labs or radiology reports. Otherwise the doctors again, left in the dark. And I think also at some point to, to let the doctor know what is, I guess, your biggest expectations or fears. You know, again, sometimes, again, it takes a little time, but a patient will come in and they're talking about this and they're worried about that and a lot of somatic complaints. But then they'll say, you know, but my mom died two years ago from breast cancer. You know, am I at risk? And, you know, you need to address these things. And as, I, as we said earlier, it's OK to Google your condition. But listen to your doctor and hopefully the person you've chosen, trust his or her experience as to take you down that path together. So what's your thoughts about that? If I, you know, it's about going. I mean, I think those are, I think those are good suggestions. And if you, if you look at our table in that uh, JAMA article, the mm. very first thing we talk about is what we call uncovering information uh, in your patient's uh, yes. history. Mm -hmm. So I, the way that one is pitched is from the point of view of having the physician do things with the patient to uncover information. But you could you could put the shoe on the other foot by saying these are some of the things that the patient can do in advance uh, in the by way of making their agenda clear, uh, talking about what it is that they think they're going to they need to disclose to the to the physician about the right. history of the particular situation. Um, and uh, they make their concerns uh, very clear and in, in, in detailed. So in some senses, that first um, subcategory that we had in the article on uncovering information by the physician can be put in the hands of the patients by saying in advance, by saying, if you want to be a good patient uh, and a good responsible patient and get the maximum uh, uh, 
output from this interaction. So my last question, if you can hear this, Dr. Capella, any last personal tips you have for the listeners to get the most out of their doctor's visit, if you could pick out one or two things? Um, I, I would say to make sure that you have your, your, this is consistent with what you've just said, have your agenda uh, with you in advance, probably in a more permanent fashion than in your in your head, right. number one, and take away with you uh, information in a permanent form, whether it's textual or whether it's auditory or so on, so that when you're leaving the environment, you have the kind of guidance pretty clearly uh, set as to what needs to needs to happen. And from the point of view, you know, uh, those two things, and they're, you know, they're eat there at the beginning and at the end. And all they're doing is taking that uh, kind of communication process and putting it into a, a solid form that uh, you are bringing in with you. You can make a, your own little checklist and it, you're taking away and uh, you can see what the kind of res- pertinent responses are to that uh, checklist. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. Dr. Capella, I want to thank you for taking the time to help all of us have a better, more rewarding doctor visit. I think this stuff is so important. Uh, so again, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, my, my pleasure. I hope that people will get a chance to take a look at the uh, at the article. It's pretty simple and straightforward because we didn't want to mm-hmm. inundate uh, you know, stressed out uh, doctors about that uh, important business of communication with their patients yeah. and to do it in a sort of a, a simple and straightforward a way that uh, will still be helpful. Yeah, Thank I you hope, for the uh, yeah, opportunity. I, to share about my it. pleasure. I, I hope you like, yeah, just as, to add on to that, too, I just really hope that a lot of young medical students get some exposure to this because it is a process and it takes years, but you know, you, you have to be aware of it. So, yeah. anyway, yeah. thanks so much. 